want me to sing a song for you? <laughs> he really wants me to play guitar. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So, um, first of all, we welcome all the devotees uh, to his corner of Richmond Saturday Peace Program uh, at Krishna House. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is especially, we would like to welcome our guest devotees coming uh, for the first time and some after a long time. Uh, so, who is here for the first time? So, we have a few devotees coming for the first time. So, we have uh, Mother Deborah with uh, her two sons, uh, Jason, Jason and um, Stacy. Yeah, so we are very, very happy to have them. Uh, uh, so let's welcome them by loudly chanting. Hare 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 welcome, thank you. And we have one mother with us. Prima. Prima. Okay, so we have uh, Prima Mataji coming for the first time uh, from Richmond area? Yeah. Oh, Jai. So we are very happy to have uh, Prima Mataji and let's welcome Mataji by loudly chanting. Hare 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 so uh, we are very happy to have Abhishek from my family back. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so as uh, we know, uh, we have a very, very special guest. We are very, very fortunate to have a very special Vaishnava, senior Vaishnava with us. His Grace Mahatma Prabhu for the first time at his con of Richmond. Uh, so um, for some of you, those who don't know, uh, I would like to give a brief introduction about His Grace Mahatma Prabhu. Mahatma Prabhu is a very, very senior disciple of uh, His Divine Grace, Srila Prabhupada. Uh, joined uh, International Society for Krishna Consciousness uh, back in 1969. Um, so when he was uh, 19 years old, uh, he was studying at, at um, University of California at Berkeley. And uh, at that time, he came in touch with Shri Prabhupada's books. And that's how um, he uh, became a devotee. And uh, then he joined in Berkeley Temple in 1969. And since then, Shri Prabhupada engaged uh, uh, Mahatma Prabhu in so many different projects. You just name it. Any service, uh, Mahatma Prabhu uh, did it for Shri Prabhupada. He's been temple president many times. He's been Sankirtan leader uh, many times. He's been a college preacher. Uh, he's been even a cook. He's been a book distributor. So, so many wonderful you services. You my halava, you will say it's the best halava you've ever tasted. <laughs> <laughs> you and know why I can say that? Because I once did an Indian program, like 300 Indians, oh. in 1971, and they said it was the best halava they ever had. Oh my God. <laughs> so now Prabhuji is uh, based in... Um, Alachua, uh, but he's been traveling all over the world practically. He's been an initiating spiritual master, uh, accepting disciples uh, and a senior spiritual leader in our movement. Prabhuji is also a wonderful musician. Uh, a wonderful musician. He also, so he's uh, now focusing on presenting these wonderful workshops for the benefit of not just the devotees, but people in general. So Prabhuji travels all around the world uh, to give these wonderful workshops. And uh, again, we are very, very happy uh, and fortunate to have Prabhuji. So let's welcome uh, His Grace Mahatma Prabhu by loudly chanting. Hare 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 Jai Prabhupada. Hare Krishna. So, Divyanand Prabhu wanted me to speak about balance. And I was saying last night, there's so many areas of balance you could speak about. And we actually gave a class this morning online about balance from the second chapter of the Gita, being equal poised, happiness and distress. But what I think is most relevant to us is balancing our lives. So that's what we're going to talk about today, creating balance between the different areas of our lives. And we need to do that 
because we need time to give to our sadhana. Right? You agree? It's like if you, if you, if you want to get good at something, you have to give time to it, correct? So, if you and I both start to learn something, and you give five hours a day, and I give five hours a week, you're going to get much more proficient at it, right? So it's the same with sadhana. If we can't manage to find time for sadhana, seva, for our family, for our health, for our work, and so, then it's going to suffer. So, one of the things that happens when we're not balanced is usually in order to achieve success in one area, another area suffers. You, you, let's say you start a business, a lot of people become very successful at the cost of either their health, their family, or their spirituality, because they're working so hard. So it's working? Yes, sir. Yes. Right. Um, this is very common, isn't it? What do they say? You. You work so hard, you lose your health, and all the money you made, you spend in the last three years of your life to regain your health. Something like that. So that's very common. So I want to talk about that. So that's what we have: avoiding su a success in one area at the cost, not avoiding <laughs> achieving. No, it's supposed to be achieving. This is what happens when you do PowerPoint late at night. <laughs> Don't write late at night. <laughs> That's my advice. Achieving success in one area at the cost Whoops. Whoops. Wow. We're moving up, huh? Then you're gonna have to readjust that. It got bigger. Yeah. So, um, achieving success. You understand? You have that experience, you know? You Okay. Or you have some people, they're, they're very into their spiritual life, and they neglect their material life, and their material life is falling apart. Something, you know, their job, they're not giving attention to it, and so forth, because they're so into hearing and chanting. Right? So there has to be balance. Now, it depends on the position of life you're in. If you're a brahmacharya or vanaprast, then you're not working. So then that's not even a part of your balance. Right? So, here's a definition. I like this definition of balance. A state in which various parts form a satisfying and harmonious whole, and nothing is out of proportion or unduly emphasized at the expense of the rest. So that's actually what we just said, right? Nothing is out of proportion or unduly emphasized at the expense of the rest. So that's, that's what we're going to be talking about today. Does that sound good? Are you ready? Do we have pen and paper? Yes. Okay. So this is going to be interactive. So you're actually not just going to be able to sit there. You're going to have to do some work. We don't have a lot of time, so I chose uh, some exercise we can do. And so we're going to, if you don't have pen and paper, you can write on your phone also, but we'll pass out pen and paper. So raise your hand if you need pen and paper, and we will find it somewhere. Keep your hand raised, and now we'll come around and give you. So Prabhupada uses the word balance in the seven purposes of this kind and the first purpose. Did you know that? We're going to read it. <laughs> 
Now you're going to know. To systematically propagate spiritual knowledge to society at large and to educate all peoples in the techniques of spiritual life in order to check the imbalance of values in life and to achieve real unity and peace in the world. So I italicized to check the imbalance in life. More pens? When Prabhupada says to check the imbalance of values, what does he mean? Who can tell me what does he mean? What does the imbalance of values mean? Now he's trying to figure out who's answering the question and who needs paper. <laughs> okay, don't raise your hand, just give me the answer. <laughs> what does the imbalance of values mean that Prabhupada's referring to? I think it's to neglect spiritual life for, for material life. Yeah. Yeah, so um, everybody finds it difficult to give much time to God, isn't it? So that's why in the Christian world, basically it's one hour on Sunday. Out of how many hours are there in a week? 24, 24 times 7 is what? 168 or something? What? 168. 168. So out of 168 hours, most people can find one hour for God. And I heard something last week which I really liked, and I actually put it on my Facebook page. And it says, we cannot find time to give back to the creator of time. Mm. Isn't that nice? Mm. We can hardly find any time to give back to the person who gave us all the time. So that's an imbalance of values. One hour, that's... Common. I don't know. India, they give more. Some people give every day, half hour, right? Whatever so on. India, Hindus give more than most Christians. Um, most Christians, congregational people, it's one hour on Sunday. Maybe they do something Wednesday night, but generally, mostly, it's one hour on Sunday. That's not a lot. So that's an imbalance of values, and that's pretty good because most people in America don't actually go to church. Maybe in your city they do, but you get, go up north a little bit, go out to California, not so much. Latest statistics, only 40% of the Americans are connected with the church. And so who knows how much time they're giving to spirituality. Of course they can give it on their own, but this is just a general idea. So. An imbalance of values. So for us, we have daily sadhana. So this discussion around balance is definitely going to have to focus a lot on daily sadhana. So here are some areas that I see are, are the way, I don't know if you can read them all. At the top it says sadhana, then seva, which we're going down clockwise, family, work, finances, and then that's uh, no. No. recreation. I wanted to find recreation because you might say, well, you know, we don't go to the Disney planet. <laughs> so what do you mean by recreation? By recreation, I mean re-creation, things that revive you. So going to the Dom is recreation. Walking in the forest is recreation. Um, Playing the guitar and singing a bhajan is recreation. It's something, uh, or let's say you're an artist and you draw pictures of Krishna, you come to class, you guys. Something which revives you, which rejuvenates you. That the word recreation means to recreate. And in fact, some psychologists have studied this and said that people who don't have recreation burn out. And you're trying to do a lot, but you do more by stopping. Right? It's called sharpen the saw. Chopping the tree down, stop and sharpen the saw, recreate. So that's what I mean by recreation. Not that it's just since you might think, oh, recreation means wasting time playing sports and so on. But it means doing things which will revive you. So so maybe every day you read Prabhupada's books, but once in a while you read like half a day. And that's your recreation. That's, I, I, I don't, in this case, I wouldn't call it sadhana, I'd call it recreation. It's not a daily thing, but it's something 
that you really need to do periodically for, for regenerating, rejuvenation, like that. So that's what I mean. So the idea is we need to balance all of these so we don't succeed in sadhana and do, and do no service, or more commonly, do tons of service and compromise our sadhana. That's very common in this time. Because we're passionate people, we like to do things, we like to create things. So generally, we get compromised. There was a funny story when Prabhupada came to Los Angeles. At that time, there was a company called Spiritual Sky Incense. Yeah, and it was big, big business at that time, all run by devotees. And Prabhupada visited them, and he visited the BBT, he visited the art department, he visited, they had a studio where they did recordings, and all the recordings of Prabhupada were organized by that studio. He went everywhere in the LA community and visited everything, every, every department. And every department he encouraged them, go on. Go on with your music, record, distribute, go on with your book publication, go on with your book distribution, go on with your painting. Everywhere he was encouraging them. And then when he went to the business, he didn't say anything. <laughs> and so they said, Prabhupada, everywhere you went, you encouraged everybody. Why didn't you encourage us? He said, you're all vicious. I don't need to encourage you. You just do business 24-7. <laughs> you do business. That's how you think. He said, I need to encourage you in your sadhana because that's where you're lacking because of that strong tendency for making money. I don't have to inspire you. So that's where we, we get sidetracked a lot, seva. We're, we're passionate people. We like to do things, we like to create things, we like to spread the movement. And it's needed, obviously. But it tends to cut in often. For many of us, it cuts into sudden. So um, another big problem I've seen in ISKCON is seva cuts into family because you're all working. So when are you free? Saturday and Sunday. Saturday and Sunday, for most people, that's family time. Because, you know, some of you go to work at 7, come back at 7 or 8, you're not... Maybe your kids are asleep when you leave, and they're asleep when you get home. <laughs> so, Saturday and Sunday is the family time, right? But many devotees have told me that they've had family problems, because the day, the family day, they're at the temple all day. You know, okay, it's great if the family's there and you're doing things. But, you know, it's obviously different when you do it together, right? One-on-one, -on -one alone. So, I'm not making any judgment or any recommendation. I'm just saying people have come and told me that. That they've given so much time to seva, and they only have those two days, that other things get neglected. Maybe also the house doesn't get cleaned, the laundry doesn't get done, or their car is not taken. There could be so many things, right? And so that's, um, those three, Sada and the Seba family, those are interesting areas. Um, as you know, work can interfere with your sadhana because of the time. Now, I have a nice story for you. In, I don't know when it was, maybe six years ago, devotees from Dubai, and I had been to Dubai, wanted, were taking a tour around America and they wanted to come to Alachua and they'd ask us to do a little workshop. So I got some of my god brothers, god sisters, and we did a workshop. And the question was asked to them. And it was a workshop, I think, on this topic. And the question was asked to them. If you're making enough money, but you're offered a better job, like you're making enough money and you have like, you work eight hours a day, five days a week, and you know, it's real simple. You go to work and come home at the same time every day. But what if you were offered a better job, which meant some irregular hours, some weekend working, possible 13 hours a day, but you made a lot more money, would you take it? And he expected everyone to say, no, I wouldn't take it. And I expected, because I'd been to Dubai, everyone to say, yes, I would take it. And he was shocked when everyone said, yes, I would take it. And he spent the next, he couldn't go on with his intended lesson, because when the students don't answer the way you think, you have to re retrace your steps. And he spent the next hour convincing them not to do that. <laughs> Which was very interesting. And what was the basic 
the basic context was, if you have good sadhana, even though you may not be able to send your kid to Harvard because you're not taking that better job, keep your sadhana. If they go to, you know, the university here, they'll be okay. Okay, don't go to Harvard, you know, it's not the end of the world. But you may give up your Krishna consciousness to send your kid to Harvard. That's not a good idea. Now they had other reasons. They said, well, if I have a better job, better position, more influence, I can influence people in Krishna consciousness. But, but that may have been true. But he was saying, some days you're going to work all day Saturday, some days you're going to work 13 hours a day. And add it up, how much time does that leave for sadhana? Not a lot. Now there's another problem. If you've taken initiation, you actually don't really have the luxury to accept a job like that because you're not going to be able to chant your rounds. So that's something that anyone who's taken initiation or anyone who's going to be taking initiation has to consider. Every decision I make actually affects my sadhana. Did you realize that? Mm -hmm. yes. It does. Every decision you make, where you're going to live, where you're going to work, what you're going to study, the, the size of the house and the car, you know, everything affects your sudden. Because if I want a bigger car, a bigger house, if it's right at the end of my budget, that means now I'm stuck in this occupation. I can't get out of it because this house costs too much. If I go a little less, I have a little more leeway. I can get a lesser job and still maintain myself. So you, you put yourself... You may put yourself in a compromised position, position just by the job you accept, or if you're a student, the degree that you pursue, right? Isn't it? Doctors, if you're on call 24-7, that's difficult, yeah? Um, in our Japa workshop, we, we look at our lifestyle and how it affects our Japa. So, we're going to talk a little bit about that today, just so you can see the correlation. But um, th this definitely has a big effect. Work and finances definitely affect sadhana, because they're decisions that affect how much time you have. You agree? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And you need a certain amount of time every day to do sadhana, right? <clears throat> this, I did a Japa workshop, I forget where it was. And at the end of the workshop, the devotee came to me and said, I'm having trouble chanting 16 rounds or 4 rounds or 8 rounds, I forget the number. What can I do? So, rather than tell him what to do, I said, what's your schedule? He said, well, I go to work at 7, but sometimes because, okay, we weren't in America. Yeah, we couldn't have been in America. So we were somewhere else, and he said, because I have to be on, attend meetings that go on in America, sometimes... I have to stay up till midnight. And I say, oh, so that means you go to work at one o'clock the next day? He goes, no, I go to work at seven o'clock the next day. <laughs> on those. And I go, how often do you have those meetings? He said, a few times a week. I said, don't try. What's the point? You don't have enough time to do it. So it's just a practical thing. You can't make believe you can do it if you don't have the time, isn't it? Now. In the Bhagavatam, in black and white, you can read this. Prabhupada said, one should not work more than eight hours a day. It's right mm. there. Wow. <laughs> now, we don't have control of that, do we? Well, we may have more control than we think, but right now, today, you have no control of it, because you have to go to work tomorrow, and your job specifies how long you have to work, and how, you, how long it takes you to get there and home. Unfortunately, in this city, it's probably not so bad. But isn't that interesting? And Prabhupada said, eight hours a day. <laughs> Why did he say that? Well, let's look at um, the schedule that Prabhupada had for our movement. We got up before we went to Mangalarti, then we chanted our rounds, then we had Guru Puja, then we had class, then we had Prasadam. Somewhere in the area of 8.30 to 9, we had Prasadam, then we did our Seva, and then 5, 6 o'clock we came back, took a shower, went to the evening program. That was the way ISKCON was mm. in the early days. Actually, everybody was at the morning program, and everybody was the evening program. Mm. It was just... When I grew up in California, my mother did not work. It wasn't necessary. And my father worked a regular, you know, 
He left for work at like 8 o'clock, came back at 6. That was just normal. You could work in a factory, one man, and buy a house and support a family in America in the 60s. Did you know that? It's a different world today. <laughs> right? It's, it's horrible. It's horrible. It's not just bad for spiritual life, it's bad for everything. Now, hardly you could make it with two people working, isn't it? So, when I was first, I was married when I was very, very young, and I could support myself with two days of book distribution because of the economy in America at that time. Isn't that amazing? I never like thought about money. I dropped out of college. I never thought about money, education. It was like two, three days of sandwich time. That was enough money to live. It was so inexpensive in America. If you lived in the LA Temple and you were a Grihasta, they charged you for lunch and they charged you for breakfast. You know how much they charge? One person for two meals, $1.25. <laughs> the boys were complaining that was expensive. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. So it was very easy to live then. So it's much different now. Now we have to be a little more careful about decisions we make, isn't it? Um, health. Um, obviously, um, if you burn out, um, my experience is, if you don't take care of your health, you just burn out, then you have to take care of your health. <laughs> but you usually have to spend more time taking care of it, because <laughs> an ounce of prevention, prevention is worth a pound of cure. So usually it takes more time to cure something than it did to prevent it. So um, you might know the story, Prabhupada had a stroke, or he was very ill, and it was Memorial Day weekend, and there were no doctors available at that time. Different now. But at that time, they couldn't get a doctor. And in those days, doctors used to make house calls. That was very common. When I was a kid, and I had the flu or the measles, I never went to the doctor's office. They always came to my house. That was just normal. Um, and so they got a doctor to come to see Prabhupada, and he was drunk. <laughs> And he looked at Prabhupada and said, the old man needs to walk. And I thought, okay, this guy's crazy. And Prabhupada said, no, he has spoken correctly. From that day on, Prabhupada took a morning walk religiously. He never missed it. Unless he was extremely, extremely ill, like extremely, he never missed his walk. And every day he took massage. And he said, the massage is keeping me alive. And there was one class, and devotees started coughing. And Prabhupada said, why are you coughing? Don't you have warm clothes? And then Prabhupada turned to the president and he said, you should make sure they have warm clothes. And he said, you have to take care of your health. He stopped the class and he talked about it. And he told the story of Sanatana Goswami. And um, he wanted to commit suicide. And Mahaprabhu said, you cannot commit suicide because your body belongs to me. So you have to take care of your body. So your body belongs to Krishna and you have to take care of it like you take care of Krishna's things. So that was the moral of the story. Prabhupada stopped the class to tell that story. And then Prabhupada said, you should take care of your health. He said, you know, don't become a fanatic, but some consideration. You can become a fanatic and, Prabhu, can you do service? No, today, you know, I'm on a, I'm on a sprout fast. You know, I'm kind of weak too. I'm doing anything. So he didn't want to go to that extreme unless it was absolutely necessary. But the other extreme is you don't think about it. You're just totally unaware. Now I have some bad news for you. If you like to have some fun, I, this is not fun, but it's a kind of fun, go into your house and read the labels on your shampoos, your soaps, your toothpaste, your cleaning materials, and then go Google them. And you'll be in shock, because practically everything in your house is carcinogenic, or bad for some part of you. Your lotions, your creams, your deodorants. I don't want to depress you, but I, I stay at people's homes, and that's one of my pastimes, is to look at all their unhealthy products. And I never tell them, because it's like kind of overwhelming, because practically everything in your house is bad. Every chemical, you know, lotion, shampoo, it has things which are bad for you. Um, yeah. So... Um, we need to be conscious of these things. You know? you know how good milk is for you? Milk is one of the healthiest foods. You know how bad milk is for you? It's one of the most... 
milk that's not from prop, the proper cow is very unhealthy. Milk from the proper cow is very healthy. So you have to know these things. If you don't know, you think, oh, it's milk, it's healthy. No, that's not milk. It just looks like it. It's really not milk. Mm -hmm. That looks like a cow. It's not a cow. That was a genetic, genetically engineered monster. Mm -hmm. It's not really a cow. We created it. And the milk from that cow, it's not healthy. You know all these health people, they say milk is bad. And all the Ayurvedic doctors say milk is good. It's a different cow. Yes? Should we eliminate milk if we can't afford to get proper milk? <laughs> that's another discussion. <laughs> we could talk about it later. Um, that's an individual decision. And there are good arguments on both sides. And I've asked this of devotees who take care of cows. And believe it or not, we have vegans who take care of cows. <laughs> Did you know that? And you know why they're vegans? Because they know they're so close to the cow that they, they don't want to support violence. And then we have devotees who take care of cows who are vehemently opposed to veganism. So, and we have gurus who are vegans and gurus, you know. So you'll have to decide. But at least understand there's certain kinds of milk that are not healthy. And all these natural food people, they're so down on milk. I heard a very cool thing the other day, which I've heard before. Cholesterol has nothing to do with heart disease. Okay, Prabhus, you can eat as much butter and <laughs> sand dish as you like. Um, isn't that interesting? And I confirmed it because when I was in India in January, I got to meet a cardiologist, one of the big cardiologists in India, who goes to all these cardiological conferences. And I said, I read that cholesterol has nothing to do with, with um, heart disease. And he confirmed it. He said, there's actually no proof that it does. People get heart disease with low cholesterol, people with high cholesterol. So, you know, you need to, look, to maintain your health, you need to be aware. Because there's a lot of information out there and there's a lot to learn. And there's a lot of bad information. I mean, I'm not a doctor, so, but there's things you can you know, learn about if you study. Okay, so now we're going to do an exercise. This is the exercise. On a scale of 1 to 10, with 10 being excellent and 1 being poor, how are you doing in each of these areas? So the idea is you're going to just write these areas down on your, your paper and give yourself a score. So you're going to see, you know, where you're in balance, where you're out of balance. So, so just write those six down, and then after each one, you give a number on a scale of one to ten, if you're doing well. Now, if you're doing well, you're doing average, you're doing poor, five is average. Now I want to tell you something though. So you might say, well, how do I score myself? Let's say I chant, <clears throat> for last year, <clears throat> I chanted 64 rounds a day. Right? And this year, I chanted 16. I give myself a five. Let's say last year, you chanted one round every day, now you chant four, you give yourself a 10. <laughs> so it's relative to your situation. So you said like number of hours, time-wise? It's, 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 it's the standard that you, it's, it's a standard you want to set for yourself. So okay. in other words, like, like what is health for you? What is good sadhana for you? What is good seva? You know, what do you, you define would be a health, healthy for you? in your situation, okay? What does your family need? What does your daughter need? Maybe she needs a lot more than someone else's. So good for you might mean I have to be home all day Saturday, Sunday, every afternoon, three, I have to be here and so forth. Good for someone else may be different. Yes? Um, like, what are the You need a pen? Not that happy. I need to share, so You have a job, you like it, you make enough money, you're not the richest person in Richmond, but that can be a 10 because it works for you. It works for you. So it's a bit subjective what you would say 10 to be. Yeah. 
If you have a 10 in something and a 1 in something else, then you want to see if there's a connection there. If the 10 is, is affecting the 1 in terms of time. It may not be, but you want to look at the, the correlation. Yeah, I have a 10 in my work. Why? Because I work 15 hours a day. I'm very successful. Okay, what is that affecting? Or I have a 10 in my work, and I have a 1 in something else, but there may be no connection, because I'm only working 8 hours a day. But wherever the one is, you want to see if it connects with anything else. It may or it may not. Then the next thing you want to do, where you have a low score, mm -hmm. then the obvious question is, what do I have to do to get it up? And what I want you to do is get a partner and discuss with them in the areas that you're out of balance, why you're out of balance and what you have to do to get it in balance. And this may be the most important um, discussion that we have of this workshop. So, anywhere it's low, you ask yourself the question, why is it low? How did I get there? What can I do to balance it? And in answering that question, you may have to look at some other areas and say, oh, I may have to minimize a little bit in this area. I put too much emphasis here, and therefore I haven't put enough emphasis. Because obviously you only have 24 hours a day. So um, balance doesn't mean every, every area gets three hours. Balance means every area ideally gets a 10 or a high score. That would be balance, right? Imbalance is three high scores, two bad scores. And you see definitely the correlation, why these scores are bad, because I'm emphasizing something else. Right? So you, you, there's no right or wrong answer, and then you discuss, so everyone's going to have to get a partner. It could be someone sitting next to you, or you can walk around and find a partner. You don't have to like them for them to be your partner. <laughs> <laughs> it's so, only for a half hour. So, Sadhana, so, 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 basically means what, what you do before you go to work. What you do in the morning. What you do in the day before, before your day starts. That's what I'm and in the evening also. Okay? Okay? Did you run off? Uh, exercise. Can they see what's up there? Uh, yeah.
some slides that I have, which are general, very practical principles about creating balance. And then I want to ask you to share what you discovered. And maybe you discovered some of these things. So this is just kind of like the laws of balance. <clears throat> and we discussed this a little bit. Just when you say, I need more balance, then the question is, well, why do you need balance? What's, what are you balancing for? What's the goal of your balance? Right? So as we discussed for us, balance is important. So we have good sadhana, we have time for seva, we have strong families. You know. So for us, I think it's pretty obvious why we need balance. But when, whenever you're balancing, you always have to look at, if I push this up, What's, going to, how's, what's it going to affect? I mean, what's, what's important? Right? So maybe something's a little out of balance. I give more time to my sadhana and my health, but my health is good. But my sadhana is most important because without Krishna, I'm dead anyway. Right? So you have to know what's important. So you know, maybe health up here, my health, sadhana up here, health down here. But for you, that's balance because that's what's important. So it's you want to ask yourself, what am I trying to achieve in the first place by being balanced, right? Like, like financial de uh, decisions, like I have to make a decision. Should I move to the city and get this job? Should I stay here? So you have to question, well, what's important? Is the financial consideration important? Is staying in one place and my kids going to one school important? How will it affect my sadhana? So, you can't really make good decisions if you don't know what it is you're after. You know, I'm after upward mobility. Oh, this will be a good choice. Kids are still young, it's okay, so we do it. No, it's gonna be disruptive, and this job is a contract job, and it may not last. I'm more secure here, I make less money, but still, this, so you, you, you know exactly what it is you're shooting for. Otherwise, you can't make a decision, isn't it? No, no, no. Does that make sense? Yes? No? Maybe? Yes. Sort of? Kind of? Yes. Okay, number two. Um, when we're talking about balance, we're also talking about time. How much time I'm giving, in this case, to sadhana or seva. So, naturally, you need to talk about distractions, because we're very distracted. So, I'm just going to read this. Our distractions waste time and thus put us out of balance. You know... Sometimes you're just on Facebook or somewhere and some cat is doing something funny and you know. I just wrote a book and I know from experience there was only one way I could write that book. And what I did is, every morning, when the world is sleeping, I went into my office, and nobody get in could get in touch with me, because all my phones and social media were off. And the only way I could write that book is to turn it off. I couldn't do it any other way. And people would complain, I can't call you till 1 o'clock, I just said, for the next three weeks. 
I don't exist before one o'clock. You know? One time my wife was trying to call me and she was really upset. So sometimes I'll leave the phone on for her. But... And then I heard this uh, self-help guru and he said something I really liked. And it's, I've heard it before, but I forgot it. He said, one day a week, I don't exist. I mean, he has that option. He can do that because he's self-employed. He says, because he has to do certain work undisturbed. So he said, like every Wednesday, I don't exist. Nobody can get in touch with me. And, and this is when I do my extra reading, right? Whatever it is, that project. I have a recording studio, and I was working on a project, but I never had time. And someone said, make an appointment with yourself. Every Wednesday at 10 o'clock, Till one o'clock, you're going to do that. You have an appointment with yourself. So little little tricks to be free from distraction. So um, here's some very disappointing uh, statistics. The average American watches four hour, hours of television, or maybe four hours of TV slash social media a day. Four hours, 28 hours. How many volumes of Bhagavatam can you read in 28 hours? Who knows how long it takes to read a volume of Bhagavatam? Everybody knows. Vaisheshika Prabhu has some figures. You read so many pages a day, you'll get through it in a certain period of time. But just, that's a lot, that's a lot of time. From my remembrance of sitting down and reading, I think you could get through, well, those were days when the Bhagavatam was in volumes, like they're not now. But we used to read like five hours and get through like, uh, like, uh, you know, what? An hour a chapter? Is that it? You should be showing Mother in notes. She, she just left, left her down. No, I think it's 40 pages a day. You can finish the entire Bhagavatam in a year or something like that. 40 pages a day. And how long does it take to read 40 pages? About uh, two hours, maybe. Yeah. 40 pages a day, you can finish it. In a year. Uh, in a year. How much will you finish? Uh, in the whole Bhagavatam. Oh my God. I think. But anyway, you understand the principle. Um, so here's one um, great lesson I learned about distraction. You want to hear a great lesson I learned about distraction? Watch him. <laughs> this is the lesson. When anybody moves during a class, we all get distracted. It, says, it shows how easy it is to get distracted. Isn't it? Okay. One of the things I learned about distraction is, is if you are not very focused on what you want to achieve in life, it's very easy to get distracted. Because when you're focused, you naturally ask the question, is what I just did, is what I just did, did that bring me closer to what I want to achieve? Or did it just postpone it? And when you don't know what it is, you don't really, you don't really think like that. You just get distracted because you're not really, you don't know you're distracted because you don't know where you're going, so how would you know you're distracted? Isn't it? How do you know you're going the wrong way unless you know <laughs> what the right way is? Or, boy, I think you're going the wrong way in the freeway. I, I don't know. I don't think we're fine. Where are you going? I don't know. You're just driving. There's no right or wrong way. So once, so we, if we're more clear, no, this japa is important. This reading is important. I need time for this. I need, I need time to write, to study. I need time to work on this project. This is important for me. This is important for Prabhupada then you tend to become less distracted. Um, my intuition is that people who spend a lot of time on the internet don't really have a life. That's where their life is. They don't have much going on. <clears throat> if you spend hours and hours on the internet, how could you do that if you had some exciting, productive, profound things going on in your life? <clears throat> you agree? So, but... Distraction is everywhere, and so we have to be a little careful, because it's easy to get distracted. So I have, I teach in my <coughs> Japa workshop, there are 11 offenses to the Holy Name. And of course, the Padma Purana could not have taught the, this 11th offense, because 
smartphones didn't exist <laughs> for the 11th offense is to have your phone on when you're chanting. And the reason is, your whole life exists in your smartphone. And when you're chanting japa, you are supposed to be with Krishna, not with yourself, not with your life. You're supposed to be out of your life and his, in his life. And if you have your phone on, it means you're in, in his life. Now, sometimes you have to have your phone on because people have to, to contact you. But generally, early in the morning, you don't need it. And it's a distraction. And just that one thing, turn your phone off. There's another thing that I teach in the Japa workshop is turn your life off. Okay, when you chant Japa, what's ever going on in your life, imagine there's a light switch. What I have to do for my kids, you know, at 3 o'clock today, click it off. What I have to do at the office when I get there, click it off. That service that I'm planning, click it off. Click off everything. You will have the most amazing rounds if you can just click all those lights off. And I guarantee those lights will flick on automatically. You just have to click them off. But at some point, you'll get really good at clicking. It'll be subconscious. When you start chanting, lights will just go off in your life because you realize, if I don't do that, I'll be completely distracted, naturally. Everybody asks, Prabhuji, how can I control my mind during japa? And I ask a question, do you, turn your life, do, you, do you turn your life off during japa? Do you tell your mind, it's time to take rest now, I'm chanting japa? And they say no, so that's why your mind disturbs you. It's such a simple thing. So many techniques to control the mind. You actually don't need so many techniques. You just need to turn your life off. If your life's off, what is your mind going to do? It's got nothing to do. It's got nothing to think about. Isn't it? Otherwise, the mind is like, you know, got to go here at this time, got to buy this, I'm going to do this project, got to go here, you know, what about this, right? Isn't it? Even if you're chanting and you're asking yourself, Am I chanting properly? I heard a class yesterday, I'm supposed to chant. Even that, turn it off. <laughs> Everything off. That was yesterday's class. You're here in the present. Turn it all off. You can think that before you chant, then turn it off. Everything off, that you're in the present. So, so if it's just a huge challenge we have that is a, a tremendous waste of time and energy. You say, well, I don't have time to do this. You should question yourself when you say you don't have time. It may be true. Now, there's another thing we have to do when we get out of balance. We may be over-engaged, and there may be some things we're just going to have to say, forever I can't do that. And that's going to come up. Um, the next one, say boundaries. There's two aspects of boundaries. One is you accepted it, and you realize it's too much. And the other one is don't accept it when you realize it's too much. Now. I have noticed in your culture, it's very difficult for you to say no to a senior. It's, you know, I don't know your culture that well, but having lived in India, if everybody in India told me they were going to do for me what they said they would do, I would be world famous ten times over. <laughs> I mean, I was going to be on TV, I'm going to be speaking at this you know, big, big, huge program, I'm going to meet this guy, you know, like everything. I would be like the man of the year. <laughs> I'm serious. You, you know, can't believe of all the things people say. So, you know, like big things, like big promises from big people. And, and I talked to a friend of mine who lived in India and was doing some big things, and he said the exact same thing happened to me. He said, they sincerely want to do it, and it's really hard to say no, I can't. So they, but for us as Americans, better you say no, you can't. That's easier for us than to say yes, I can, and not do it. Right? So it's a different culture. But in terms of balance, don't commit to something you can't do. Just say, I would love to help you, and I will think if I can find someone to help you. But I, I'm already engaged. As respectfully as you can say it, as apologetically as you can say it, I provide I don't want to commit to you and not be able to do it because I don't think that's right. But I appreciate your project and I'd love to help you. And, you know, whatever. Here's a donation, maybe that'll help. Or I have a friend, I want to call him, maybe that. So, this, for some people, some of us have a personality where we can't say no. It just goes against us. But it becomes uh, destructive. So, you know, then. If you realize, like we have in my company, I have a company called Sattva, and I do not let anybody commit to anything unless 
they're sure they're going to do it. I just, you know, I mean, I let them, but I want them. I say, don't, if you can't do it, don't commit. And don't tell me you're going to have it done by next Saturday at 1 o'clock. If you can't, once you say it, you have to do it. So that's integrity, but it also then is like, oh, okay, no, Prabhu, I can't have it done. Okay, so now we know. That's better we know, right? So it protects yourself. So you, you don't commit, and then now what do, you, what do you do if you're overcommitted? If you're overcommitted, you may have to go back to certain people and say, I overcommitted, I can't do this, I have too much. It's, it's, it's disruptive to my family, and I don't have time to be with my wife and kids. It's just too much, I can't do it. That's part of it. Um, otherwise, in our movement, I think this is true of any religious movement, there's so much to do because there's so many people who need our help, our instruction, that it's easy to be overcommitted. Right? Do you know any GBC guru sannyasi who's not overcommitted? And they're not even trying to be overcommitted. It's just there's so much to do. They have to be extremely careful, right? Otherwise, it becomes unhealthy. So we all have to learn sometimes just to say, no, I can't do that. It's too much. That means you're handing out time. You realize that? Every time you say yes, you already don't have enough time to just keep your health together and keep your house clean, and now you just commit it to something else. So think of it. Every time you say, yes, I'm handing out time. Right? And I'm also guilty of that. I have so many projects going on. Oh, my God. I need, like, 20 assistants. And, you know, sometimes, periodically, my mind feels like this. Boop, boop. You ever have that feeling? It's going in, like, all these directions, and it's just like... What do we say? You lose your mind. It's like it's like too much for you know one human being to handle at one time, right? and it's not healthy. I was in charge of a temple once, and we were putting on a Janmashtami festival, and I had this experience. Like we were having a meeting, and there was so much going on that I couldn't deal with, couldn't control, and it actually felt like my mind just went. Bloop. It turned off. It couldn't function. I couldn't. It was too much to deal with. So that's not healthy, right? I mean, if you're empowered, and you know. You're a big manager, organizer. No problem. You can deal with it. So you have to, you know, you have to see according to your nature. Uh, okay, we have. Whoops. Four. Excellent. Be straightforward. So it's the continuation. Be straightforward about your avail available time. So it's just about communicating it. Don't go. Um, like for example, um, like we said, don't commit if you can't do it. But sometimes. Someone will just say, we need this. They're not even asking you. They're just saying, we need you to stay tonight to finish this. You might have to learn to say, I'm sorry, I can't. Because I promised so-and-so I would meet them, um, or this or that. Or I have an appointment with my, my trainer at the gym, and he's only there. That's really important. So sometimes you have to just, you know, I don't know. I mean, you don't want to get fired or anything. <laughs> um, I want to change the next one to five. Whoops. This is five. So these are just uh, benefits. <clears throat> if you're healthy, <clears throat> you're more focused. You get more done, and you'll deal better with stress. So, you know, if you ne neglect your health, you lose time. Right? That's good. So, I would like to hear from you now. What did you discover in this exercise? Um, what you're lacking, how you need to improve, how you ended up in that position. What did you discover? So, Prabhupada, you said, like, yeah, that's true. In our culture, when you say no, it's like a rude gesture. Yeah. So it's still like you know, after. Well, at least at least for Americans, it's more rude. It's le much less rude to say no than to say yes and not do it. It's like infinitely worse for us. So at least, um, is, is your question? Is your are you making a statement that we have to do it, or are you are you so, saying how how can we deal with it? Um, so, uh, like in this area, like a lot of times you say no, so they won't ask you again. 
it has to be qualified now. This week I can't do it. Or this day I can't do it. So at the same time, or I can do it for half a day. Or I can do part of it. So when you say no, even the other side has to, you know, respectfully accept that no. You know? yeah. Well, that's why sometimes you have to explain it. Like I asked one of my god brothers, um, I sent him one chapter, I said, can you just review this chapter? And he said, I don't have any time, but since you asked me, you're my god brother, I'll do it. Then he wrote me back, he said, I'm going to read it on my way to India. Then he wrote me back after his India trip and said, I didn't read it on the way to India, and now I'm dealing with this and that. Is it, do you still really want me to read it? Which was a polite way of saying, you know, it'd be better if I don't. So I said, no, it's, it's no problem. So he just, it was good, at least he followed up. You know, the other thing is, yeah, I'll read it, and that, that's the last year. <laughs> so he followed up and he explained it. And he offered to still do it if it was really important. So I think explanation is good. I'm already doing this, this, and this. I would love to do this, but if I commit, I don't think I'm going to be able to do it. So, or can we do it in a month? Because I'll be finished with these other projects. Or I could, a lot of times people ask me, and I'll say, I can't, but I can advise. If I know how to do it. I can say, I can't, I don't have the time to do it myself. But if there's someone who wants to do it, I can show them how to do it. And it's been very helpful for me because one of the things that I realized was in all the things I'm doing, I have to see what's most important because if I put an energy, energy into something that's not important, it takes away from something which is important. And it's really important to be focused on what's important in everything you do. So... You know, this might be a nice service and you like to do it, but it's going to take away from something important. So I say, oh, well, yeah, I'd like to do it, but I really need to focus on this, and I've been neglecting this, and if I do this, I'll just be postponing and procrastinating, so unfortunately. You know, but please, you know, when you have service, you know, know that I, I want to do it, but now is just a bad time. That's all you can do. I mean, I'm not an Indian, so I don't know how other Indians will take that. But I can only speak for Americans. But you're an American now, so we've got to play by the rules. I <laughs> want to say this too, absolutely. I think I was given that solution. And in fact, uh, I think, I don't know, but majority of the people who come from India, I think that's where the case is. My boss very clearly told me, you know, he, he said to me directly, she knows what your problem is, you never turn off your phone, you never take holidays, you never take vacation. Mm -hmm. And you are always ready to do any anyone ask anything. Mm -hmm. Then why not I don't ask you? You tell me. So he said, you know, there's only one choice for you. You shut up. You you just take you know close your laptop. You go home, and that's it. Yeah. Don't don't reply at all. Even to me, he said like <laughs> to me because I'm going to call you because you are my first choice. So mm -hmm. as long as I have an option to call you, I will call you. Yeah. So you should know how to say no to it. Yeah. yeah. So. That's it's good, advice. A, good advice. I think in my view, what I felt is like this, the clarity. You know, I, I wanted to satisfy as many people as possible. Whatever the motive it is, but I wanted to satisfy. Everyone should feel that I am good, this person is good. Yeah. That's the motive behind it. So, <laughs> how much I can stretch, how yeah. thin it is, at what expenses. Yeah, exactly. So I can clearly exactly. see my family is the one who is suffering. Exactly. So, yeah. Uh, again, I felt like, you know, the clarity is missing, which area you want the most. So yeah, exactly. you are picking one area, not yeah. balancing it. Yeah, at the expense of the other. Yeah, exactly. That's a very good example. I had the same situation recently. We're working on a project, and the devotee's managing the project. He's calling me a lot, and I'm trying to write, and I just said, the best way for me is email, because I have to do my email, but I can do it when I want. When you call, I can't, you know. So I, you know, I said, you know, I'm not going to be available after, you know, before one o'clock, and, you know, best way is, and it's, if it's an emergency, call me, and I'll answer it if it's time sensitive. And he was okay with that. We just adjusted. It was much better for me. And I think, you know, I think a part of, a lot, part of the problem is we think, well, that's selfish or whatever, but it's actually self-maintenance. Yeah. Self-preservation. Self 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 you don't yeah. take care of yourself, nobody's yeah. going to take care of you. Yeah. Yeah. And you'll so burn you out. have to maintain yeah. a boundary. 
Yeah, yeah. that's, that's what, what it is. Like, when I was scoring myself, I was like giving myself like some pretty low scores, but like I'm in a very unique situation. I, I have, I kind of work for myself, I rent house, one house, I only have one rental, I'm not big time, but it takes enough of my time that I don't really have a job. But mm -hmm. like, so my job is just like service to the land, my farm, maintenance, and so like it's very, I really feel happy about that. So it's not work. If you love what you do, it's not work. Yeah. But then I'm, I will never say no. I almost didn't come today because my mom's house is in so much disrepair. Mm -hmm. And then so like I was trying, I would rather be here doing the work that needs done and you guys go ahead. But then I didn't feel safe doing the work by myself. So I'm here and I'm really glad that I'm here. Yeah, this but is good for you. It is a balance and it's, yeah. a, it's a heck of a balancing act to get it all yeah. in, in perspective. And it's a great question. I, I think also, you know, this guilt, there's some yeah. guilt around yeah. yes. this, but I'll tell you a story. Yeah. Um, Prabhupada always taught us, give your life for others. You know, that's like the highest, compassion is the highest thing. And so, there was one devotee that was, I feel, gave himself so much that he neglected his own sadhana and his own, his own well-being. And he asked Prabhupada the question, what is the highest, is giving yourself to others the highest? And Prabhupada said, yes. He said, but higher is saving yourself. <laughs> and he wrote it to the person who needed to save himself because he was going down, because he gave himself too much. So, so when Prabhupada wrote that, it gave us, it gave us the okay to take care of ourselves because we know we're only taking care of ourselves so we can take care of other people. And, and yeah. so we never felt guilty anymore. It was like, well, that's my service to you, is to take care of myself so I can be here. Well, this is perfect. You see the title of my book, <coughs> Uplift Yourself, Save the World? That's you first. You're not going to sit, you know, uplift yourself, change the world. You're not going to change anybody or help anybody until you do it yourself. Um, Really, like Radhana Swami, one of his disciples told me that, um, she said, you know, I like, ha she's not married. She said, I don't know if I want to be married. I like my private time. And Mara said, yeah, if I don't have my private time, I don't, I can't function. So Maharaj gives so much, but how does he give so much? Because he, he gives himself what he needs to be able to give others. So that's very important. So, um, yes. I found the scores were kind of difficult to come up with because they're kind of subjective, yes. especially when it comes to the sadhana. There have been times in my sadhana, I'm a stay-at-home dad, so I was able to score my work after your course yesterday about being in the correct dharma. If everything is, you know, working out and you feel comfortable there, and that's when you're able to do everything and it puts everything in balance, then you're in your dharma. So I stay home with the kids, and things have gotten so much better. My approach with the kids has gotten better. You know, my wife is successful at her job, and it's just a strange situation. But, <clears throat> um, so I don't know if I would have scored that work so high because I would have been thinking about money if you'd asked the question yesterday. Yeah. But now today, after you said that, I was able to rank the ten. Then my health, even though I'm very heavy, maybe by devotee standards, you know, I feel my health is good. But now it's subject to the fact that you said milk is unhealthy. And I have been thinking that I was doing work for Prabhupada and work for the cows by ingesting large quantities of milk. Well, I, at least the Gita Nagari milk is healthy. Huh? Gita, milk from Gita Nagari is healthy. Uh -huh. But store-bought, unless it's from the right, yeah. Well, Kadamba Kanaswami was making a saying that, that we the only way that we can really serve the cows is by offering the milk because the cows become elevated by offering the milk so we should never neglect milk so I did have some influence in my thinking on that yeah. you know he had his own take on veganism and also also everybody you know you have to judge things practically like you know if you're sensitive to your health you can just tell by eating certain foods that that they're fine and some are not I have this amazing phenomenon when I eat the wrong food my ears itch because <laughs> an Ayurvedic doctor put me on a diet and I followed it and then I went off it and I ate a certain food and my ears started itching and I ate a, you know, the food he told me not to eat and my ears itch and I was like okay now I know <laughs> or I eat some sweet and my ears itch you know, something with sugar or something. it's really interesting 
But, you know, after an hour after you eat and you feel like you just took a, a sleeping pill, yeah. you know that's the wrong, it's not the right food for you. But I eat the same thing, I'm fine. So, that's the nice thing about the Vedas and Ayurvedic. It's not that, like, one thing is good for everybody. It's, it's good for you, but the same thing, may, I may be allergic to it. So, you know, just be... I don't want to be a health food fanatic, but the doctor's going to speak now. <laughs> so, um, I have a question, actually. Yes. I was wondering, um, sometimes as devotees, we are, um, I don't want to use the word overly optimistic, but we use, like, we, we think, for example, if we're putting on a festival or something of the sort, we think we can, you know, we want to reach out to the biggest or the largest number of people. But if, if with the balance that you're presenting, if, 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 everyone starts saying, no, I can't do this because then, yeah. then how does that play into like, <laughs> doing tangible You're never going to invite me back again. Everything is falling apart. Well, if we, if, I, th I think that if the leaders are aware of this, then they can say, okay, we're planning to do this festival. We're not planning one month in advance, we're planning eight months in advance, so we can do it. Do you know, when I was a young devotee, Rathiatra, building the cart, advertising, everything was done in two weeks. And it was done purposely in two weeks, so we could do austerity. And some devotees didn't sleep for days. Like, we were crazy young people. And so we felt like... We can show our devotion. If we do it in three months, it's like everything's just organized. And we were crazy. I had another experience. We had, um, you know, we do these Christmas marathons. So this was in Los Angeles, biggest book distribution temple. And I was one of the Sankirtan leaders. And so the GBC, he loves to organize the Sankirtan there. And he... He really likes it when things go wrong because he can solve problems and he feels really useful. But we, we felt that that wasn't efficient. So the next year we organized it and nothing went wrong and he actually went crazy because he had nothing to do. <laughs> so his management style subconsciously will be to create crisis because that's exciting. And it's like things are going wrong and you can fix it, you know. So that's something to consider, you know, that like if, if we, here's another problem that I find. I'm not accusing anybody. This is a thing that I've observed. Sometimes a temple has a goal, but nobody is, nobody is, um, the goal isn't discussed with the congregation. It's just one or two people. This is what we're going to do. Now you're trying to get everybody enthused about it. But why don't you talk with everybody and see if they actually want, do you actually want to do this festival? No, no, I think it would be better if we just did a retreat during that week because we need it, you know. Maybe next year we'll do the festival, you know. And now the leaders are trying to push everybody who's feeling burned out from last year's festival, you know, whereas if you ask everybody, then you get by and then there's enthusiasm. Because you know there's always, there's always time when you're enthusiastic, isn't it? If you want to do something, somehow or time just shows up, isn't it? <laughs> Life, it just shows up, right? When I was a young boy, I used to play this thing two or three hours a day. Somehow or other, I was at time to play the guitar, but I didn't have time to eat my spinach. <laughs> so that's another consideration. Is, is, everybody, is everybody on the same page? And how can we do it in a subtlic way? You, know? you see, culture, when you look at culture, culture is how do you do things, not what and why. Uh, that's mission and values. Uh, and that's, that's mission and vision. But culture is values, and the values are, how do we do it? Okay, we're going to do this festival, but what's the culture? Do we do it in two weeks, three weeks, six months? How do we organize it? What are the objectives? You know. So, um, I'm going to Durban, South Africa. It's the biggest Rathiatra outside of America, outside of, uh, excuse me, India, it's extremely well organized. It's, it's, everybody in the community that can organize anything is involved. It's a big community. So they can do it big, 30,000 plates of prasadam, they have two tents that hold um, 100, 150 people, workshops going on the whole time, yoga tent, 
Kirtan tent, main stage, so many other displays. It's huge. You can't, you can't do that without major cooperation over a long period of time. So they contacted me months ago, and they're planning stuff out months in advance. Going to do this, you know. I'm like, why are you planning so soon? We're well, going to have everything. No, nothing missed, everything organized. So that's good. <clears throat> so how do you do it? What's the culture? Two weeks, six months, you know. Where everyone running around crazy trying to get the money for it. You know. That's another culture, doing something without money. <laughs> We're going to do this. Right? I've got three people to do it, and I've got three dollars, and it needs 300 people and 300,000 dollars. We're going to do it. So what happens to those three people working on it? They end up hating everyone in the community who doesn't help them. And you're all thinking, this is crazy. Why should we do this? We can't do it. And they're running around trying to do it and nobody wants to help them. So you need to get buy-in. You need to know what your culture and your values are. And then it's like, you know, how do you want to go forward? You know what Prabhupada said once? We were opening temples all over the place. And they got to a point, he said, don't open temples anymore open restaurants, and then see if there's interest, and then if there's interest, people will support you, you'll have a group, and then you can open a temple. Because what was happening is, we would go with three people, four people open a temple. Now we have a house, we have rent, and we're just on the street doing sankirtan, trying to get money to pay the rent. And it was like, you know, it was pressure, high pressure for, in many situations. So Prabhupada's saying, well, you know, go without the temple, without the pressure, you have a restaurant that makes money, and then see who's your congregation. And if they want a temple, they'll give them money, and then you do it. Otherwise, it's three people running around trying to create money. Isn't it? And another thing, just so you know, once you have a temple, you have no money problems. Because <laughs> people give money when they see the results, unfortunately. You get much more money after the temple than before, because they see that you did it. They don't believe you're going to do it. They don't know. You know, in South Africa, we built this amazing temple. I don't know if you've seen pictures of it. No Hindu gave money. It was all collected through business. Because nobody believed that they could do it. And now, no problem. They throw money at you. Because you did it. <laughs> it's just the way it is. Whether you like it or not. That's how it is. Okay. Anyone else had any other realization? Um, they want to share with us about this? Other thing you mentioned straightforwardness. Yes. That is also not appreciated in the first place. In Indian culture, it's not appreciated unless you're a senior. It's appreciated. Yes. If you're a senior. So, um, we don't want to throw out the good things in Indian culture because respect for seniors is very important. Because in Western culture, that's like doesn't exist. My daughter went to Gurukul in Mayapur. And that was one of the main things they learned. Because the students did everything. They cleaned, they cooked, they took care of the whole place. And the teacher was the guru. So it's a very good culture. But the people who are on the top of the culture have to know how to use it. Otherwise, they take advantage of it. Right? So our culture is a little different. Because our culture is that when you get to the top, you don't feel you're any better. You always feel you're a servant. Right? And ours is a culture of compassion and sympathy. The, the, problem, the problem I see, this is just an outsider's view, but I think it's a correct estimate. When you have respect for seniors, you, you have respect for gurus, parents, guruna sasyat, relatives, teachers, father, mother. This is like perfect, right? But... As Kali Yuga progresses, it gets corrupted, so the people who are being respected aren't actually respectable anymore. And then because they're respected, they take advantage of it. Okay, so I am, I am your guru, I can tell you to do whatever I want. And it doesn't matter what I do. No, it's not like that. Plus, not only does it matter what I do, but I'm just not going to tell you to do anything, because if I don't think you can do it or it's good for you, I won't tell you to do it. Just because you're my disciple and you have to, no. You come to me and say, Guru Maharaj, you told me to do this, but I'm finding it difficult. I say, okay, let's talk about it. No, no, I'm your guru, you have to do it. You know the story when one disciple wanted to remarry and Prabhupada said, okay? You know that story? And so Prabhupada's servant said, why did you say okay? Because you always say we shouldn't do it. He said, because he was going to do it. <laughs> I could see he was going to do it. 
So why should I tell him not to if he's going to do it? And then he's disobeying me. So I said, okay. And um, I told the story this morning. One, one lady, her husband had left, or she came, her husband had left, and then she became a devotee. And then she was a little older, maybe her late 20s, she was thinking to remarry. And she asked Prabhupada, should I remarry? And Prabhupada said, you want me to tell you what to do, or you want my opinion? <laughs> do you understand the difference? Like, this is what I think, and you can do what you want. Or I can tell you. So it says Prabhupada was like, well, what are you ready for? You know, his opinion was you shouldn't do it. Because I don't think it's you should do, but if you want, you can. So he gave her that option. So that's that's the way the culture works. It's like you're respecting the seniors, you're doing the right thing, but the seniors, if they if they don't respond properly and they become dictatorial, it ruins everything. You know? If you feel compassion and understanding and sympathy from the senior, then you can say, I'm sorry, I can't do this, and they'll say, Okay, I totally understand, no problem. That's the way the culture should be. So, you know, you get parts of the culture, but you don't get the full thing, then it doesn't work. You know. Anyone with a long hair, beard, and a turban that's got a Madison Avenue advertising or the equivalent of Madison Avenue in India can become a wealthy, famous guru in India, right? Because you're supposed to respect gurus. And that would be wrong not to respect them. Even though there's pictures of this guru lying in bed with the latest Bollywood star, but still you kind of didn't really see that picture, even though you did see the picture. Right? No, that was Photoshop. It's not really real. Right? That's how you're trying to see. Okay, you know, but no, that was a Bollywood star in his bed. You, you have to see that. So on both sides, he can only go so far. Isn't it? Yes. There was one guru in India, a young man, very flamboyant, and he was giving a, a lecture on celibacy. I mm -hmm. saw this on YouTube. And after 20 seconds, I said, this guy is a sexaholic maniac, and he's got girlfriends. Why else is he talking about celibacy? He's trying to cover himself up. He's talking about celibacy like this. <laughs> he's wearing beads and beautiful turbans, and he's like this really attractive guy. Mm -hmm. he's talking like that, you know, he should be celibate. <laughs> celibacy is it's the heart chakra and the lower chakra when they merge. You know. I'm looking at this guy. No, and then I was flying to Bangalore, where he's from, and you know. The magazines, you know, there he is, him in bed with the Bollywood star. So, you know, and his disciples denying it. The picture's there and they're denying it. it's all fabricated. Okay, there's, it only goes so far, right? So either side has to respect within boundaries. But, you know, Bali Maharaj rejected his guru. So there's that boundary. If the guru goes off, okay, you can reject it. You know? and you're a leader, yes, you, you have to be followed, but you're compassionate, you're sympathetic, you, you see yourself as a servant of the people you're leading. So then it works perfectly. So, we have to understand, we have Vaishnav culture, which is not exactly modern Indian culture. So, there are many things, remnants of it, in Indian culture which are very good, but sometimes it is not good when taken to one extreme or the other. So we have to understand those things. The dreaded mother-in-law, right? Why, why would you have a problem with a mother-in-law? Because her mother-in-law, she did whatever her mother-in-law said, right? Because that's the culture. And her mother-in-law did whatever her mother-in-law did, right? So now, you're the mother-in-law, you expect your daughter-in-law to do whatever you said, but Hello, look on the calendar. It's 2018. It's not 1923. So people don't do that anymore. And you have to understand that, otherwise you create a problem. Okay, in principle, you are right. Your daughter-in-law should do what you want. Just like the guru is right, the disciples should do what they want. And Prabhupada, fortunately, was smart enough to know that people surrender on different levels and are capable on different levels. So he didn't push them beyond their level. Right. So, you know, an intelligent mother-in-law will say, okay, I understand, you know, this daughter-in-law doesn't want to stay home, she wants to work, she got 14 PhDs, probably she had an idea of doing something in the world, you know. But, you know, when the daughter-in-law comes home with three PhDs and the mother-in-law says, you can't leave the house without my permission, 
that's not going to work. She wants to be a, you know, a professor at a big university. So, you know, you have to understand these things. Okay, that's not the traditional role of the woman, but it's 2018. That is pretty traditional. <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> right? Yeah, women are, you know, more women are graduating university now, I think, even than men. So the world changes. So you, you have to adapt. Prabhupada was the expert in the So he adapted to those cultural differences. And, um, you know, if somebody couldn't do something, they would tell Prabhupada. You know, he couldn't do it. He said, all right, do that. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't so bad. I mean, sometimes Prabhupada said, no, you must do it. Okay. Yes? Is it okay to have an average score in your sadhana and then just have like, as, so that you can have an elevated score in your family life? Or should you be respecting sadhana or your ashram? Like your grihasta? Okay, that's an interesting question. Because everything affects everything else. I, I think part of it is how would you define average? <coughs> you're uh, doing 16 rounds a day. You get up early to do your rounds early so that you're not disturbed. You read the Srimad Bhagavatam. But there have been other times, and you see other opportunities where you could chant more. Yeah. But during those times, like I was chanting more, doing more practice that way. And now I read a little bit during those times, you know. But you've got a lot of cleaning, a lot of service to do at the same yeah. time. So. Okay. I mean, it could be a higher score, really. I've just had noticed that I've done more rounds before, well, but I narrowed it down to 16 so that I didn't neglect the children. Yeah, the well, things are so interrelated. I, I do a workshop on marriage, and one of the big realizations I had about marriage, I don't know about Indians, but for Westerners, is that if they're not running after one another with knives and throwing pots at one another, they go, we have a good marriage. That, that has become the new good. You know, you're still alive. <laughs> you know, the children haven't, you know, been damaged. So, you know, that's the new good. Um, which obviously isn't good. It, you know, so you, you don't want to lower your good, relatively speaking. But at the same time, we have to be careful because we have this big responsibility of raising children. And if we neglect the children, and home responsibilities in the name of service and sadhana, that creates a bad impression on the children. So maybe your sadhana goes down, but it, it saves the kids. So, you know, it's like you're chanting japa, and then your son or daughter wants to talk to you, and you say, no, I'm chanting japa, I can't talk to you. All right, you can do that once in a while. But if you do that every day, there, that's going to have a bad effect on your relationship, and they're not going to have a very good feeling towards Japa, because in their mind, Japa was the thing that got in the way, of, or you know, no. So you want them to chant Japa, you want, and so forth. But so you have to be careful. So you have to see what's important. Um, sometimes with the family, you'll go see the relatives, and maybe that's not the most Krishna conscious thing, but it's important for your kids that they that they're with the relatives and so on. So you do it, and then you rephrase your sadhana. This is part of my sadhana to take my kids to see their grandmother. And, you know, this is an extension of my sadhana service. So sometimes service does get in the way of sadhana. If it's temporary, it's fine. Like we're going to put a big festival. So I chant sixteen rounds, and I work all day. Okay, festivals in three days. After the festival is over, I go back to normal. That's okay. If it's three months doing that, it may not be so okay. So you can readjust and say, no, but this is service, this is important. And um, what I did for writing my book, I, I couldn't do it going to the temple. I have to write in the morning, get up, chant, and then some days not chant much, write because no one will bother me in the morning, and then later I'll chant in the day. It's not best for my sadhana, but it's guaranteed I get, I get the work done, and it was temporary. So you make these adjustments how one affects the other. Um, I have a daughter, I have family, so I have to, you know, sometimes I have to do the same thing. I could be hearing and chanting, no. I'm working on my helping my daughter with her homework. And I go, ah, oh, I'm not going to do this. We could be reading Bhagavatam again. <laughs> <laughs> you see, that's, that's typical imbalance. That's, it's not even imbalance, it's fanaticism. Right? Yes. So you have to evaluate how one thing is going to affect another. And it all goes back to what's important. And you know, your kids are going to grow up pretty fast, and you know, you can't change anything you did. 
and you don't want to regret when they're 20 years old that, whoa, you know, I chanted 25 rounds a day and I, that extra, you know, that extra nine rounds I could have spent with them and I didn't and now they hate my guts and they don't want, you know, so it's like, okay, you chanted 25 rounds and all your kids hate you and they're not devotees and they're eating meat. You know? So, you know, you have to, to look at the ramifications of it because that happens. It definitely can happen, right? Like I say, everything is, it's, everything's in balance. You move one thing, it moves another thing. Yeah. Mm. Yes? So the beginning, uh, you said, uh, uh, like, my previous question, uh, the legitimate my previous question, what if we say no to people? Or uh, if we are in a community and a person is lacking in something, a devotee, a devotee instead of uh, you know, helping that person, if you start like, criticizing and then, so how to deal with that means, how can we help that person? Oh yeah, of? right, right. Um, well, there's a nice, um, it's, I think it really boils down to culture. Like, what is the culture you want to create in your community? Because if we don't consciously think of the culture we want to create, we'll still have a culture. It'll be the culture that we brought to, that we have, that we grew up with. Some good, and some not so good, right? So I like your idea, I like this idea that if someone is having difficulty rather than condemn them, our culture should be to help, right? Also, um, when you see a person criticizing someone else, that's also the person criticizing, he's also in a sometimes calling out for something. But that's one of the reasons we criticize, we're, we're calling out for, we have some need we don't feel valued, um, or we're trying to deal with a problem, or we lack our own self-confidence, <coughs> we want to pull someone else down. So all these things are good to be aware of when you're in a community. Otherwise, you're going to criticize the person for criticizing, when actually that person may be just indirectly calling for attention, like helping. You know? If you know anything about psychology, you see that a lot of times when people criticize, they're actually calling for something that they need. And if you don't get the message, you put them down for criticizing. Because we have a whole philosophy is really good at putting people down who criticize. <laughs> Isn't it? I mean, you can be justified shastrically, but that person may actually need your help. And sometimes we may criticize, and it may be justified because somebody's doing something that's detrimental to the whole community, and your criticism is only out of concern for other people. So it's not criticism as we we see it in Shastra, but some people may see it that way. So you know, you need to be clear in your definitions. So my, my experience of dealing with this is that we have to be a little bit aware of the culture that we have and then be aware of the culture we want to create. Because if we're not aware of the culture we want to create, and what we have to do to create it, then we're just going to end up with these problems. And everyone who comes in is bringing partially in a materialistic culture. And it's just another person adding to the mix of a culture that we don't want. So they bring in good things, but they'll bring in something. And, and if we say, this is our culture, you know, if you have a problem with somebody, then our culture is, you talk to the person, you know, very friendly, open, and you know, say, could you explain, I saw you doing this. And that. We have more open communication. This is how we do it here. So don't talk behind their back or something. You create that culture, you try to enforce it. Then, then you can design the culture that will work for you. And then as people come in, you don't have to teach them anymore because you have the culture. See, in my experience, I'm a, as a teacher, the culture is the best teacher. You know, like let's say you have a problem here and some devotees aren't getting along and criticizing it. And you know, we'll talk about it in the humility workshop. But even though we talk about it, unless it becomes part of your culture, I can't change it until you change it in the culture. So maybe you'll get inspired to change the culture, but the knowledge won't change it. You have to actually change it in your culture. And once you have it in the culture, then you don't have to teach it to anybody because that's how they learn. They just see it, you know? If somebody comes and sees, and you know, so sometimes this happens in ISKCON, where a new person comes and somebody criticizes someone to the new person. Oh, you know, I, you, you want to come here, you know, because the temple president, this and that, are you sure you want to come to these programs? That happens. You know, crazy as it sounds, it happens. So, we want a culture where 
those things never happen, right? In a culture where, you know, if you have any problem with anybody, feel free to discuss with them. You know, we're very open, we want to talk about it. <coughs> then they'll start doing that. And th then, if they start criticizing, nobody's going to listen, because it's not part of the culture, and they just won't be able to do it. And if they really want to criticize, they won't want to be part of your, your community, because there's nobody to talk to. Isn't it? So, I think, you know, in, in one sense, you do it to protect yourself from anyone who could be toxic to your community, because there's the cancer can't grow, because there's no one to grow with it, because you have a different culture. But if you don't, if you have a cancerous culture, or a toxic culture, then it can grow. That's the problem. At least that's my observation. Now, changing the culture requires time and energy. There's ways to do it. And it usually starts from the top, the examples of believers, the older devotees. But it's a conscious effort. You have to know what culture you want to create. You have to actually be clear about it, and then you have to know how to do it. And then when people are not doing it, you have to talk to them and say, Prabhu, Mataji, you know, this, that. It's not our culture. We don't allow that. In a nice way. But I guess it goes back to my point. You have your culture, but we have Vaishnava culture. And that's really what we want. And that's, you know. Um, another problem is... We don't want to create a pretentious culture where we have to look good to get respect of others. Like, I need your respect, so I'm going to pretend to be Krishna conscious. We don't want to, we don't want to put people in that's a very bad position for spiritual advancement if you have to pretend. And then you go home and you can just be in total mind. But just pretend when you're here to look good and everyone will like you. You, know, you don't want to create that culture. If you have trouble, you want to be able to talk to people about it without being judged. You know, I'm not pretending to be a good devotee. I'm not, and I want to talk about it. These are the problems I have, and I need your help. But if you create a pretentious culture, you can't do that. Or you'll be judged when you tell me what's wrong, and then I'll judge you. Oh, how could you do that? That's offensive. You know, that's horrible. You know, I don't want to hear it anymore. Just don't tell me. So you can't create that kind of culture. It doesn't solve problems, right? But so you can see there may be tendencies for that. And you want to, if you notice those tendencies, you want to deal with them. Because it's, it's revealing one's mind and confidence <coughs> means you can say what's really going on and you're not going to be judged. That's what it means. Right? And on a scale of 1 to 10, how close are we to do, doing that? And if it's even 9.9, .9, it's not close enough. It has to be 10. Where I can go to you, you can go to me, and you can tell me what the problem is, I can tell you. And we don't get judged. We just try to help one another. That's loving exchange. You know, so there's a lot of talk about um, devotee care. Well, that's an essential part of devotee care, that you can oh, reveal your mind in confidence. And you know what confidence means? Nobody else hears about it. Now, how well are we doing that? Being able to reveal our minds without being judged, and nobody else hears, not even your husband, not even your mother. Nobody hears what, what that person said, because it's confidence. Yeah, that's the culture we want, isn't it? But that's the culture of our Shastra, isn't it? So, that takes some work. But if you can do it, then you'll have this amazing community, and anyone, anyone who comes here will want to become part of it. Because it'll be the, the most functional family they've ever been part of. Because most families aren't that functional, are they? And some families are pretty dysfunctional. You can come into a community that's very functional, open, not judgmental, sympathetic. Wow, who wouldn't want to be part of that? That's what people are looking for. You know, Radha Maharaj, he said people are not joining because of philosophy, they're joining because of community. I mean, of course it's both, but community is really foundational. Because it's, it's what you feel that makes you act. I want to be part of this community because of what I feel. Not necessarily because of what I know. Okay, I believe in your philosophy, but I look at all you guys and go, nah. I don't think so. I'm out of here. <laughs> right? But I don't even know your philosophy, but I look at all of you and say, I don't even have to know. You guys are amazing. You're so happy, you're so kind. And I want to be part of it. Isn't it? Yes. So we have to stop. Um, we, can, we can discuss more of this in the um, workshop on humility. And we can have more of a, a guided discussion. 
because there's so much to discuss on this topic of humility, and and we can take it any direction that you direct me. Um, so we're going to do that after we have prasadam, and um, a little disclaimer. I've done many courses, and the feedback I got is the course on humility is by far the heaviest because it deals with false ego. <laughs> so, if you are ready and man enough or woman enough, I invite you to stay. If you're not ready, then you can run out the door after Prasad. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's going to add, you will be asked to reflect on your own faults and your own ego and. Um, you know, your own motive, but really look at our motivations. Like, why are we doing things? Are we doing it so people will like us and praise us? Or are we doing it to serve Krishna? So you get to learn these things. But the topic is, it's very fascinating. I've, been, I've taught it many times, and every time I teach it, I'm fascinated by it. It's because it's, it's, I think humility is the most foreign concept to us as conditioned souls in our Shastra. <laughs> I think we have the most difficult time understanding it. It's like, because you can't understand it if you don't have it. And it is so, you can't have it unless you have prema. It's such a foreign thing. And so it's so interesting to study it because it's so different from what we are. And I'll give you a little preview of coming attraction of, of what humility is. Um, humility means that I think everyone is better than me. Grade yourself on a scale of 10, how close are you to that? And you can go minus if you want. It goes down to minus one away. That's what it actually means. You know, when you achieve full humility, you think everyone's better. The story with you just couldn't find anybody better, anybody uh, lower. Every, only everybody's better. Just meditate on that. That's enough to crack your brain, isn't it? That's why I say it's such an interesting time. Everyone is better than me. When I become humble, I will see everyone is better than me. Prabhu preached to them. Why should I preach to them? They're better than me. I've got to come down off that vision to be able to preach and make distinction. Otherwise, everyone, I say everyone's better. Is that amazing? No. You don't just see it. That's how you feel. It's not intellectual. You feel that. You actually feel you're better. And I have stories where Prabhupada exhibited this. Amazing stories. Which I won't tell you now. But these stories are like, you, you haven't heard these stories, and stories from Bhakti Siddhanta, incredible. I mean, they're really like, you'll, I, I, I'm not over-exaggerating, but when you hear them, you'll practically, you won't faint, but you'll feel like fainting. You'll just go, I never heard such an amazing, it's like so out of this world, the way the pure devotee thinks about humility, that you just become stunned. It's incredible. It's so different. You know, we see a fault in somebody, oh, he's got a fault. It's objective fault, I can talk about it. You know? No, it's not like that. Just Bhakti Siddhanta said, just because you see it and because it's real, you have no right to talk about it. <laughs> That's not a Vaishnava. So, you know, we start turning things around and it's really, really interesting. So, that's a little preview, a little appetizer. And so, <laughs> as soon as we take prasadam, we'll start whenever we finish. Okay? And he so, wants me to play guitar. So I won't play guitar until the humility is done. So if you don't come for that, you know, I'm too bad. I'm just going to miss Mahatma playing guitar. Okay, so we have an incentive. You know, we'll get to hear guitar. If we, so um, based on time, uh, we'll, we'll take about 45 minutes uh, to uh, have prashadam, honor prashadam, and uh, we'll set up the classroom downstairs. Uh, so we request everyone to please try to um, under Prashadam will quickly today and also just wants to um, inform that we have this wonderful book uh, by uh, Mahatma Prabhu uh, we have a lot of copies so you feel free to you know grab for yourself and for your friends and you know other family members uh, Prabhuji would be happy to sign it for you also we have um, if you're interested in where I am online then it's on this card so all the the, my s website and other things, if you're interested. Website, WhatsApp group, um, Facebook, SoundCloud, YouTube. So that's there also. Okay. Thank you very much. Hope you got something to think about, take home with you, meditate on. Create a little more balance and um, 
try to live a more peaceful, normal life, it's important for your Krishna consciousness, isn't it? If you're living this hectic, crazy life, it's not healthy. And let's remember what Prabhupada said, eight hours a day. <laughs> I'll tell you one last story, this would be the good icing on the cake. Prabhupada's father was a cloth merchant, and he opened his shop at 12 and he closed it at 6. And the whole morning he did puja. Then he went to work and he came home and did puja. And Prabhupada said, externally it appeared that he was a cloth merchant. He said, but actually his real business was puja. Because mm. that's what he did most of the day. Mm. So you know, in that culture in India, village culture, you don't have to stay open that long. You're just selling to local village people, isn't it? It's a, you know, it's a perfect uh, arrangement. So... We're living in a very different world, and if we're not careful, we're going to get sucked in by it. So, as long as we have our vision of what we need in life, then we can create the balance to reach our goals and not get sidetracked. So that's very important. Okay? Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Hari Hari Bo. Mahatma Prabhu Ki Jai.